Hi, I'm Maximilian Alvarez. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Real News Network and host of the podcast Working People. And this is the art of class war on breaking points. Look, it is no secret that I am no fan of corporate media. And if you are watching this channel, then you, like me, probably have a healthy distrust or even disdain for most corporate media outlets and pundits and would like to ignore them entirely if you could. But the fact remains that for better or for worse, we can't just ignore them. Being engaged, democratic, media literate citizens means at least having a good handle on what the media ecosystem looks like and how media both independent and corporate media alike shape our discourse, our public policy, our political activity, our culture, so on and so forth. And regardless of how we feel individually, we can still acknowledge that the changes taking place as we speak across the corporate media landscape are a big story, and they will produce political ripple effects that we'll all have to contend with, some good, some bad, others that will just have to wait and see how they develop. From the earth-shaking news on Monday, April 24th, that Fox News has cut ties with its star host Tucker Carlson, and CNN has done the same with host Don Lemon, to the news that 538 founder Nate Silver is expected to be cut from ABC, and NBC chief executive Jeff Schell was fired for sexual harassment, there are some seismic shakeups happening in the world of corporate media right now. And everyone's talking about what these shakeups will mean. And everyone is, everyone seemingly has an opinion on uh, Tucker and Fox News, Lemon and CNN, and I completely understand why. But I can't help but wonder why, if we are all as invested in the inner workings of our media ecosystem as our reactions to this week's news would suggest, why has it been so difficult to get people to care about critical changes happening within other corners of that ecosystem? Changes that I would argue will have just as much, if not more, of an impact on our daily lives and our respective access to journalism that we need to be informed democratic citizens. Take, for example, the ongoing strike at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, a vital journalistic institution that is descended from the Pittsburgh Gazette, a paper established in 1786, and that has been serving the broader Pittsburgh area for generations. In October of last year, over 100 workers represented by five labor unions, including production, distribution, advertising, and accounts and receivable staff, walked off the job on an unfair labor practice strike at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. The strike began after the newspaper's management, Block Communications, which is owned by the Block family, cut off health insurance for employees on October 1st. As Michael Sinato reported at The Guardian at the time, quote, the strike is unfolding in a U.S. media industry that has seen widespread layoffs over the past decade, with newspapers hit especially hard. Workers at the Post-Gazette have been working without a union contract since March 2017, claiming they haven't received any pay raises in 16 years. End quote. So why aren't we talking about the strike at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette? And what can focusing on this strike and looking at the broader media landscape tell us about the changes happening in the industry that we might not be able to discern if we are only focusing on the big ticket news about Tucker Carlson and Don Lemon? To talk about all of this and more, I'm honored to be joined today by our two guests, Bob Batts Jr. and Steve Mellon. Bob is a lifelong journalist who worked at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette for 30 years before going on strike and being named interim editor of the Workers' Strike paper, the first in the digital age, the Pittsburgh Union Progress. This is a really cool paper that is run by striking members, uh, by workers on strike at the Post-Gazette. As of today, they have published over a thousand stories, plus photos, graphics, ads, and even a fictional story, uh, which you can find at unionprogress.com, which offers free subscriptions and a thrice weekly newsletter. Steve Mellon has been a journalist and photojournalist for more than 40 years. 
For the past few decades, much of his work has focused on working people. He left the Pittsburgh Press after a strike there in 1992 and spent much of the next four years traveling to industrial towns to report on the changes people there were experiencing. He returned to newspaper work in 1997, taking a job at the Post-Gazette. He's been on strike since mid-October 2022, along with his colleagues, and now co-chairs the union's Health and Welfare Committee and writes for the strike paper, The Pittsburgh Union Pro Progress. Bob, Steve, thank you both so much for joining us today on Breaking Points. Thank you, Max. Thanks, Max. Well, uh, it's it's great to see you guys again. We have, of course, um, spoken at different points um, for the reporting that we've done on the strike here at the Real News Network, including a worker solidarity live stream where we had Bob on a couple months ago and a full length working people episode, my podcast where I got to speak at length uh, with Steve. If folks want deeper context on the strike, I highly recommend that you go check those reports out. Um, but for those who haven't seen those reports and for those who may in fact be learning about this crucial strike for the first time right now, I was wondering if we could start by going around the table and just sort of giving people the essential context they need uh, about this strike, um, what led to it, how long you know that process had been brewing, what the sort of key issues are um, that brought you and your coworkers out on the picket line, um, and and any other kind of essential context that you think folks need to know up front about this strike that they may just be hearing about right now. So, Bob, why don't we start with you? Then Steve will go to you. All right. Um, thank you, Max. And um, uh, you know, I feel like I'm sitting here at my dining room table. I'm caught in two different things that are going on. Sort of the the economic storm that's hitting the media industry in general and sort of this uh, labor uprising or uh, recognizance or awakening that's also happening. We're certainly caught in both of those things. Our strike has a long history. It's very complicated. There's a lot of nuance, but Max, you started out right by talking about how people haven't gotten contractual raises in 16 years. That's uh, older than my teenage son is. Uh, that's embarrassing to say, but that's the, that's the case with this, this strike. Um, we work in the newsroom. We're both editors, photographers, reporters, so we make you know the news. We cover the news. But um, we were preceded on strike by four other unions who had their health care taken away in October of 22. We already knew about that because that happened to us in 2020, which was three years after our last contract expired, and we could not come to terms with a new one. Our company imposed conditions on us, said, we're at the impasse, we cannot come up with a contract, we're just gonna tell you how it's gonna be, and that includes this new healthcare that's different than what you guys bargained before. So when 2022 got here, we were ready to go on strike on our own uh, issues, our, un, our own unfair labor practice charges, which we had already just finished this past fall, um, explaining to the uh, National Labor Relations Board, and uh, since we went on strike, a very memorable day that Steve was talking about, the an administrative law judge said that everything that we're mad about, everything that we are, are on strike over is correct. The company's wrong. They're breaking federal law. Uh, we felt good about that, but that was a couple of months ago, and we're still on strike um, because uh, we, have, we still have not been able to get that ruling enforced. We're hoping to get the NLRB to, uh, to do that and to, uh, you know, enforce basically what this law judge has said in the meantime here we are on strike yeah actually that's pretty good bob uh the, the you know it's still depressing to me to think 20 to 2006 i mean here i'm 63 years old i haven't had a raise in uh she's what 16 years um uh you know we've been without a contract in 20, since 2017 you know i didn't need uh, an administrative law judge to tell me that that the post because that was bargaining in bad faith because I sat in on these negotiating sessions and I'd listen to the company's attorney. You know, it's, it's always the company attorney. There are several of us from the guild that are usually in there. It's a bargaining team. And then there's a number of us who just come to, to, to witness and to be a part of the process. And I sit in there and I, and I listen to the company. You know, we, we will go through an extensive process of putting together a proposal on, say, healthcare, how to resolve this issue. We'll have meetings and, and you know, we'll debate a good plan and we'll take that plan in 
and we'll present that plan. And uh, then what we'll hear after uh, our extensive explanation is that uh, that won't work for us. We like our original proposal. That's over and over and over and over again. And it was just, it was good to hear an administrative law judge uh, confirm that the company has not been bargaining in good faith, that, you know, that, uh, that uh, they, they don't want us around. They don't want a union around. They want they want to have a a, a union free shop. I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, they they uh, they want to be able to run the newsroom the way they see fit with no input from from uh, from the workers, from the people that actually put this thing out. Uh, I think we all agree that that would be a disastrous uh, that would be disastrous for the Post Gazette. And Max, I was so glad to hear you talk a little bit about the history of this paper. And that's one of the things that really pains me about this is that. You know, this is a newspaper with a with a long and storied and and uh, a wonderful history in this city of doing doing a great job of covering local news, uh, evolving with the city. Uh, and the way I've seen this newspaper treat people in just the last, uh, I don't know, four or five years, it's uh, it's it's heartbreaking to me. I know Bob has committed a good chunk of his life to this paper. I have a number of our colleagues have. We have a, a number of uh, younger colleagues who've come in very talented people who are committed to telling the story of the city to reporting the important things that people need to know and to see them treated like this is uh, uh over and over and over again it's really frustrating uh to me and it's it's ang it, and it and it angers me and you know one of the things that that i, I really appreciate is this is, is being able to talk about it you know we've been out for seven months now and there was a time when uh, it was, you know, we were on the news a lot because it was new. It was a new strike. It was, you know, first newspaper strike, I think, in more than two decades. So it, it, there was a uniqueness to it. Um, and uh, but that time has passed and other things come along. Max, you mentioned uh, the Tucker Carlson thing and then Don Lemon. And, you know, we kind of get shoved to the side. And uh, and it's important that that uh, that 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 this story stay in front of people for a number of reasons, not just because of what the impact that, that this strike is going to have on the news industry, but the role this plays in, in the general uh, movement now that I see where, around the country where uh, people are standing up in their newsrooms and they're saying enough of this. You know, unions have been hammered since 1980, since Reagan took on the PATCO workers. And, uh, you know, I think here we are 40 years later saying uh, enough of that. Uh, we're tired of getting pushed around. We're tired of getting stomped on. We want to have a say. Uh, we deserve that. We're the ones who put the paper out. We're the production workers. We're the journalists who put this paper out. We want to have a say in how we treat it. You know, I've, I've got, I've, I'm going to have, in an hour, I'll be downtown, downtown Pittsburgh for a rally. The uh, Starbucks United workers are having a rally today. They're in the middle of their own bargaining sessions. That to me is a great thing. I look, uh, these are, you know, I remember unions when I first came to Pittsburgh in the 80s. And, you know, there were guys like I me mean, now they were older white guys i go down to stand on these starbucks line and these are younger people they're fired up this it's it's a very diverse crowd and uh, they hang with us they'll, they'll come and st they'll stand with us on a picket line these are people my daughter's age 24 years old i'm standing next to tori tambellini a couple weeks ago we were trying to stop a truck on uh, one of the delivery trucks from delivering the post gazette we were standing in front of idle, an idling mac truck that's a very uncomfortable thing and Tori looked at me and she said, I'm not moving. Are you moving? I said, I'm not moving if you're not moving. So we did not move. And that truck didn't get through. There were about, probably 30 of us there, 20 or 30 of us. That's good to see. That warms my heart. Oh, yeah. No, I think that's that's a beautiful show of solidarity and something that I really don't want to be lost on folks uh, as a crucial part of this story. Right. Um, we're going to finish off by talking about what the Post-Gazette strike means in the context of the labor movement in general, which we cover relentlessly here uh, uh, for my segments on breaking points at the Real News Network, so on and so forth. Um, but I, I think in that vein, right, it's really significant that, A, uh, these striking journalists uh, at the Post-Gazette have been keeping a strike newspaper going to continue serving the communities that they are reporting on and for while they are on strike, not getting, you know, paid. Uh, that in itself, I think, is a really remarkable accomplishment, and everyone should go subscribe uh, to the Union Progress um, because that is one way that you can support striking workers at the Post-Gazette.
Um, but also, like you said, Steve, I mean, the fact that y'all are standing in solidarity with Starbucks workers who are fighting their own fight, right? That is what the bosses fear. That is what we need more than ever. And that includes folks um, who are watching this. We all have a role to play in that. Um, but before we get there, I want to just zero in really quick on kind of what this means for um, the media industry and particularly the um, market that you guys serve over there in the broader Pittsburgh area, right? Because there's there's a lot going on here, as we said, that I think for the average news consumer may be hard to parse out, right? Because media gets sort of like lumped into this giant bucket, right? Uh, in fact, a lot of people's well-founded disdain for, say, corporate media or the media in general tends to come from, you know, people who they perceive to be, you know, the partisan hacks and figureheads on the mainstream networks like Tucker Carlson, Don Lemon, the people at the opinion section at the New York Times, right? I hate the opinion section at the New York Times, but even I have to admit that it's like, well, you know, the New York Times sucks ass because, pardon my French, for the opinion section, but they still do, the news desk does, you know, reporting that's important. They got a lot of resources, right? I just have to kind of accept that, right? So even that's just like one example of how this slippage can occur where we lump in the people uh, that we righteously hate in the media and we throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? And that, we can see that kind of happening uh, at, on the local media level as well. Right. Um, but we have like a real like intense drama unfolding here where, you know, the former owner of the paper, um, Bill Block, you know, passed away. And then this sort of succession style drama unfolded uh, with who was going to inherit the paper, what direction it was going to take and how that connects to the larger sort of. Um, kind of changes that we're seeing in the industry with um, local newsrooms closing basically continuously for the past 20, 25 years. Um, as we speak right now, I mean, there are uh, there's a bit of a bloodbath kind of going on in the media industry with layoffs at a wide range of outlets from fandom, ESPN, Vox, NBC News and NBC, MSNBC, Vice News, BuzzFeed, The Washington Post. There are union drives at outlets like Business Insider and Hearst Own Magazines. I mean, there's a lot going on here and it may be hard for people to parse through. So I just wanted to ask if you guys could say a little bit about what it means to have a uh, union workforce at a local outlet like the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Like, why should people care about that? Well, I mean, you care about what's happening in your community and what your local officials are doing and what your neighbors are up to and how much they paid for their taxes on that woods that got torn down next to your house and they're building a development to it. Local news matters to to your community. Um, I'm here to tell you that you can cover a community very well with corporate news because seven months ago, I was corporate news. I got paid by a corporation to cover local news. Suddenly, uh, six, six, seven months ago, I was independent media because I was suddenly not getting a paycheck. I was doing exactly the same thing. Boots on the ground, you know, butt on the ground. My, I live on your ground journalism, uh, telling you what's going on and what somebody says is going on isn't true, um, how the state playoff basketball championships are going to work, who's running for county executive, you know, who pays for it can cor corporately funded good local news is great because you have a lot of people who are very good at what they do and they are keeping a watch on your officials and your culture and your everything. So uh, we chose to just keep doing that on strike because that's what we do. That's what we do. That's what we're made of. So we don't care if we get, we do care, but we can do it if we, whether or not we get paid for it. But the, the, I would say like the North Star, to, to quote something that Steve was talking about at a meeting we had the other night is covering your local news and being smart about it. I mean, there's a big dis difference between me and Steve and Tucker Carlson, and I'm nothing but glad about that. We are journalists. Tucker Carlson was like a celebrity, you know, figurehead. Keep your eye on local news. You'll you'll care about it at one point, even if you think you don't. 
And um, that's the thing that we're fighting for with this strike in Pittsburgh. Yeah, Bob, I'm glad you mentioned that. that, that uh, I mean, we're doing this now without any pay. So you know, that's, uh, uh, I think, a testament to our colleagues who are committed to this. You know, there's a, there are a couple disconnects here. One, you're right, Bob, there's a disconnect between what we do and what Tucker Carlson and Don Lemon does. I mean, uh, that, that there's there's a huge divide there, and it, and it pains me that we're, we're sometimes lumped in that category, you know. We're the ones who go sit in three-hour meetings, you know, and take endless notes, and then pour over that story till eleven o'clock at night to figure out, okay, what's the important take out of here? You know, what do the what do the readers need to know? Uh, that's the kind of thing, you know. We we go, we go sit in these high school ball games because that's important. You know, it's important to a community to that takes pride in its high school athletes. You know, to to uh, it, to that's that's how this community gets a sense of who it is a sense of identity for a community you know a newspaper a local newspaper forms a lot of functions it does inform people lets people know the important things what's happening at the county jail you know why this has been an issue in here in pittsburgh why we have so many people die in the county jail they're tearing down that wood just like bob said who's what's going to happen with the taxes what's that mean to me those are all really important things in addition it helps you know, it's a reflection of the community, and this gets to the feature stories, the obituaries that we publish. You know, the community sees itself reflected in the news in a local newspaper in a way it does not going to see itself reflected on CNN or MSNBC or Fox News or any of these others. That's like a uh, that's a, that's a fantasy world. Uh, if you want to see what the world actually looks like, what your community looks like, go to your local paper. You know, the the one the other disconnect here is that you know. Uh, Bob is right. You know, we're we're committed to this. The people who walked out of that newsroom on the 18th of October are committed to local journalism. Uh, they, they're committed because we're still doing it. We're not getting paid, but we're still doing it. We still think it's important. Obviously, the owners of the paper don't share that belief. And I think that's the thing that bothers me so much about uh, many of the newspaper owners now owned by hedge funds or whoever, their values are not our, our values. Uh, you know, their values are, are treating uh, these newspapers like piggy banks that they can drain dry and then cast aside, you know, cast the carcass aside. What's that do to the community? Uh, it's heartbreaking to see what that does. To, you, got, you know, we got some communities now that have, you know, major metropolitan areas that have newspapers that have a staff of 40 people. You cannot cover a, a, a place like Pittsburgh with 40 people. You know, we're trying to do it what Bob, how many people we now have a dozen, we're working our butts off and we're just, we're not even scratching the surface here of what needs to be covered in this city. Uh, so you know, that's uh, uh, that's heartbreaking to me. I think what, what's happening here in Pittsburgh is important. You know, I, I, I've had news friends in this industry for 40 years. And I, if, if, if I knew 50 people uh, back in, uh, 1990 that were working in the newspaper. And let's go to 2000 who are working in the newspaper industry. I can probably count two or three of them that are still in the industry now that are, that are not here in Pittsburgh. You know, so many of these people have gone on, they've retired, they've taken other jobs, they're in PR, they've gotten out of the business, they're teaching, they're doing something else. Um, and uh, I, we don't, we can have a voice in this. You know, the, the thing that's important, what I love about Pittsburgh, it's a union town, and that we're, we're a union shop. And so the company can't come in and just say, you're out of here. Uh, we're changing things. We don't need you 10 people. We're, 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 we're tossing you guys. No, we're going to stand up and say, no, you're not going to do that. You're not this. What we're doing, what what happens at the Post Gazette is going to affect this community. And uh, we're not going to put up with that. We have friends and neighbors. We know uh, we have a community we care about. We're not going to let that happen. We care about what happens to our families and to ourselves. Obviously, it's all wrapped up to, into a whole. But if we didn't, if we did not have a union, we Bob and I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking. We would have been out of here probably ten years ago, uh, given our age and, and and everything. They would have tossed our asses out of here. So, uh, you know, I, I wish everybody in the newspaper industry had this opportunity. You know, somebody sitting in the middle of uh, in the Midwest uh, whose boss comes in, whose editor comes in, the owner comes in and said, we're going to two days a week and I'm getting rid of 40 percent of the staff. Um, deal with it. And uh, we we uh, we can in Pittsburgh say, no, we're not going to deal with that. You have to deal with us. 
Well, and, you know, I want to kind of pick up on that because, as we said, um, with you guys still doing the, the work that you're committed to, uh, we got to let Steve go in, in a couple minutes so he can go report on, uh, you know, the Starbucks campaign there in Pittsburgh. So, like, with the last five minutes that I've got you guys, I want to kind of drill down on this point. Right. Because, again, I'm, I'm speaking to viewers here at Breaking Points. I know you guys are a kind of heterodox bunch. Right. That's why you're here. We got folks uh, with more right leaning politics, more left leaning politics somewhere in the middle. That's great. Um, but I want to caution everyone watching against taking the partisan bait here. Right. Maybe you hate BuzzFeed News and the work that they did. That's you know, that's fine. That's that's your call. And maybe you're cheering on the fact that they just, you know, laid off, you know, like all their all their workers and they're they're going under like you may think that that's a win for your side. But what we are trying to communicate here is that the larger groundswell the larger systemic failings, failings of for-profit journalism, corporate ownership or, or private equity ownership over the vital civic institution of journalism and the media landscape writ large, this spells disaster for all of us, regardless of what side of the political spectrum we happen to be on. So you may cheer when you know people at an outlet that you hate kind of get fired, but I promise you it is coming for the outlets that you read as well. Mm. And the independent journalists, the folks on Substack or even outlets like ours at the Real News Network, like we are not going to be able to serve all of the needs that need to be served here uh, in the absence of those outlets. Like we've got a long way to go to rebuild a healthy functioning media ecosystem in this country, especially one that is committed to actual journalism, not just corporate uh, sensationalist crap like they you know peddle at the mainstream networks, right? And in that vein, we also, um, for that very reason, have a vested interest in the struggle at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette as far as it pertains to the labor movement, right? Because labor, workers banding together and actually forming that backstop that Steve talked about, right? That, that kind of wall that working people can form if they are banded together in such a fashion to say, we are not going to just let rich people and corporations and elites dictate everything that happens in our society. We have a say in what happens here. We deserve to be at the bargaining table to bargain over the terms and conditions of our employment. And in fact, how these businesses, whether they be Starbucks, Amazon or the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, are run and we all have a vested interest in that as fellow workers as consumers so on and so forth so i want to kind of end um just with a kind of short round of the table talking about that and the significance of the post-gazette struggle in terms of the broader kind of labor movement that we cover here at breaking points at the real news and beyond because I think one thing that really sticks out to me, because I see, I get the press releases from you guys and your union, um, every time there's another bargaining session with management at the Post-Gazette, and they don't show up, uh, they or they just show up and they stonewall every new proposition, they just fold their arms and say, nope. Like, what seems very clear to me, and I'm speaking for myself here, you know, not speaking for anyone else, but looking at what management at the Post-Gazette is doing and how they are trying to stretch this strike out, they don't, they are not bargaining in good faith um, at the bargaining table. As the NLRB has said, they are trying to effectively kill the unions, right? They are trying to strangle the unionized workforce uh, to the point that they could eventually push a decertification vote and get the union out of their newsroom. They don't want to close the shop down, but as you said, Steve, they want to get rid of the union. This is happening all across the board, right? Warrior met coal. Coal miners in deep red Alabama who were on strike for nearly two years. Uh, Warrior Met Coal has filed a petition to decertify the union there, the United Mine Workers of America. That was always their plan, was to stretch things out, demoralize people, not bargain in good faith, and ultimately try to kick the union out so that the company could better serve its Wall Street, Wall Street shareholders. Keep in mind, the number one shareholder of Warrior Met Coal is BlackRock in New York City. This is what Starbucks is trying to do. They're trying to delay. They're trying to union bust. They're trying to fire people and close down shops until eventually the union drive runs out of steam. This is what workers at CNH Industrial, who were on strike in the Midwest last year, 
told me when they were saying that management also was not budging at the bargaining table and they were getting whispers that management was planning to push a decertification vote to get the UAW out of their shop. So this is class war that we are watching. And I wanted to ask um, Bob and Steve if you just had a few words to say to folks in closing about the significance of the Post-Gazette strike in terms of the labor movement right now in this country and what folks watching and listening can do to stand in solidarity with y'all. Well, I mean, I, as I said before, that we're, we're sitting here in the middle of the two storms, the economic storm that's hitting media and also this sort of labor, uh, you know, uprising that we're part of too. So Steve and I laid out how passionate we and our colleagues are about local news and that's coming from our place as journalists. Now we find ourselves as kind of labor activists, labor uh, catalysts, and we care quite a bit about that as well. Steve is going uh, to this Starbucks rally today, not just as a reporter, which he's very good at, probably as a photographer as well, but he's also going someone going as someone that has um, uh, a long-standing but certainly newly uh, uh, honed interest in and understanding of labor issues. And so one thing that I think is going to come out of this, I don't know where any of this is going to go, and, you know, even our own strike. And, and this isn't my idea. I stole this from our uh, National News Guild president, John Schloys. But when you have a whole bunch of journalists in Pittsburgh on strike, or we have 120 news workers, maybe now 40 of us are in the newsroom. When you have the New York Times workers, newsroom workers, uh, descending on a shareholders meeting yesterday, you have the Washington Post uh, newsroom workers taking like a, a lunch long strike. You know, we're going to lunch out today. It's not just us. And uh, what you're going to have is you're going to have journalists that at least are more sympathetic and empathetic and knowledgeable about labor and how strikes work and what it feels like to be on the line for two years in the case of Warrior Coal and, and everything that Starbucks workers are going through. So uh, in some ways, I, I just think some of us media types independent or corporate or, or both are getting schooled on what some of this stuff means. And I think Steve and I and my colleagues are just as passionate about uh, unions and having a voice in your workplace. And we want to be part of that as well. Well, you know, um, you, you know, we're what, Bob, now seven months into this thing. And, uh, you know, there are times when I'm on the phone on the people with, with some of my colleagues a lot, you know, it's as, as, as a member of the Health and Welfare Committee. And, and so I have these conversations a lot. And people tell me, you know, six months, seven months into this, that, you know, it's like the, the world is going on without me. That, you know, I, my life is, is stalled and, and the world's going on without me. These are fellow strikers. And, you know, I have these conversations with people and, and it's, it's easy to see that uh, on the inside. What really helps, I've, I've had a couple conversations this week. Yesterday I was on the, the phone with the, uh, young woman from the uh, Pacific, I think it's the, uh, uh, the Pacific Asian labor organization here in, in Pittsburgh. It's a fairly new organization uh, advocating for, you know, people who are immigrants, uh, uh, who are new, new into the workforce here that really don't understand their rights, uh, trying to teach people what those rights are and the people in the work, newly entered in the workforce and how they can stand up for their rights. And, you know, she said to me, I was interviewing for her for a story and she said to me afterwards, she said, Steve, she said, we're watching you guys. We're paying attention and we really appreciate the stand where you're, you're taking. I've heard that a couple of times in the past week or so. And, you know, that really lifts my heart to to know that that uh, that, that this effort is 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 worth it. You know, no, no matter what the outcome is here, you know, the fact that we're standing up, uh, that we're we are in, in some ways uh, showing people how this done. You know, we one of the problems we have is that. We, we can't go to anybody for advice because nobody's been on strike. Nobody in the newspaper business alive now involved in this has been on strike this long. So, you know, we're, we are blazing uh, new paths. You know, I, the Starbucks workers, you know, one of them came up to me a couple of weeks ago and said, Steve, we, we kind of feel like you guys are our big brothers. Um, so, you know, that that uh, that makes me feel those comments like that. You know, it's, it's hard to state how uh, how sustaining those comments can be. And how important it can be to hear those things from us, because, you know, sometimes when you're in the bubble and you're getting up every morning, every day, and you're thinking, I'm still on strike. I still don't have any money. I got to go to work for free. You know, we have all these other issues we have to deal with, um, you know, keeping the strike fund up. Hearing that is a, is a, is a important for sustaining this, keeping our mental health 
uh, uh, in, in, in good stead. You know, there, there's a Workers Memorial Day uh, tomorrow. One of the big issues that they're dealing with now this year, it's not just people dying on the job, it's mental health. They realize that. Uh, so it's kind of fortuitous uh, that, it's, that, that, uh, that we're talking about this at this time. Another big thing, you know, you're right, Max, the Post-Gazette views this as a war of attrition, you know. They've got money, we don't. That's, that's what it boils down to in, in their minds, and they think they can win with that. You know, we have a strike fund. You know, I hate to come down to this, but, you know, we have a strike fund. That's how people are paying their bills. Uh, and, you know, I hate to say it, but, you know, if you go to the go to PUP, go to the donate page and donate some money to the strike relief fund. Those, you know, we need mental health. We also need to be able to sustain this financially because the blocks are probably right. They've got more money than we do. You know what we have? We have the community on our side. We have the moral high ground here. I'm going to claim that. Uh, and uh, uh, we have the best journalists. The one thing we don't have is we don't have the money that they have. They're they're right about that. I don't think that I, I'll take where I'm at with no money any day of the week. But the fact is, we got bills to pay. Well, I just want to say from the Real News Network and Breaking Points, we are with you guys. We stand in solidarity with y'all. And I want to encourage everyone watching and listening to this to please go to the Pittsburgh Union Progress website. Uh, subscribe to the strike paper. You can, as Steve and Bob mentioned, you can find links to donate to their strike fund there. Post publicly about this. Keep this story alive. Let people know about it. Reach out um, to the owners of the paper to express your thoughts and feelings about the strike and the the value of having um, these workers secure the contract that they deserve, so they can keep doing the work that they love and serving the communities that they are a part of. So I want to thank the great Bob Bats Jr. and Steve Mellon for joining us today on Breaking Points. Bob is a lifelong journalist who worked for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette for 30 years before going on strike and being named interim editor of the workers' strike paper, the Pittsburgh Union Progress. As of today, they've published over a 1,000 stories, plus photos, graphics, ads, and even a fictional story, which you can find at unionprogress.com. Steve has been a journalist and photojournalist for more than 40 years. For the past few decades, uh, much of his work has focused on working people. He left the Pittsburgh Press after a strike there in 1992 and spent much of the next four years traveling to industrial towns to report on the changes people there were experiencing. And he returned to the newspaper work in 1997, taking a job at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Uh, where he has been on strike with his co-workers since October of 2022. Bob, Steve, thank you both so much for joining me today on Breaking Points. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Max. We hey. always enjoy it. Thanks for keeping the story alive, Max. And thank you all for watching this segment with Breaking Points. And be sure to subscribe to my news outlet, The Real News Network, with links in the show description. See you soon for the next edition of The Art of Class War. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Solidarity forever. Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now, and Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us, and if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.